So to introduce Alan Schliemann, uh, Alan Schliemann has worked as an author and speaker for Stand to Reason since 2004. He trains Christians to share their convictions in a persuasive yet gracious manner. Alan teaches about some of the most controversial issues of our time, abortion, evolution, homosexuality, bioethics, and Islam. He has been a guest on both radio and television and has spoken to thousands of adults and students across the country at churches, conferences, and college campuses. And we know you'll be really blessed by his talk today and uh, I think one that we're all really interested in anticipating today. So why don't we welcome Alan Schliemann. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. My, uh, my parents were born in the city of Baghdad, which is in the country of Iraq, which, which by the way, is not a great vacation destination. <laughs> in case you're thinking about wanting to take a trip this summer, hold off on Iraq, like maybe for the next 2,000 years till things settle down. But uh, my parents did not raise my brother and I as Muslims. They actually raised us as Christians. And the reason is, is because my people, my ethnic background, is called Assyrian. So out of curiosity, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Assyrian people. Yeah. Chances are, if you've read any parts of the Old Testament, you'll recall the Assyrians are talked a lot about in the Old Testament. Which sounds pretty cool. Until you realize we were the sworn enemies of Israel. So consequently, that made us the sworn enemies of God. So that was kind of a bummer, like growing up and finding that out, you know. But with a lot of therapy and counseling, I got over, like, you know, the emotional turmoil of knowing that reality. But enough about my problems. <laughs> Let's talk about what we're here to discuss. Um, raise your hand if you know someone, a friend, a family member, a coworker, or a classmate that identifies themselves as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Raise your hand if you, yeah, just about every one of us is raising their hands, and I too am raising my hand because I too have friends and family, close family, that identifies in that way. And notice then, this raises the question, how do we as Christians continue in our relationships with our friends and family who identify this way without compromising our convictions? Now, it is going to be an uphill battle for us to be able to do that in light of the culture that we live in today. Now, when I say the word battle, I do not mean to suggest that this is a battle against LGBT people. It is not. They are not the enemy. The real enemy are the false ideas that the culture has bought into about the nature of sexuality and about the nature of what they think the Bible says about sexuality. And so that's why the, the two main goals I have for our presentation here, number one, is I want to tell you what I think the Bible says about sex, sexuality, homosexuality, and transgenderism. And then number two is I want to give you some practical principles that can help you to navigate your relationships or your conversations with friends and family who identify in this way, okay? So that's the direction we're going. So first, let's talk about what I think Scripture says about these topics. Now, before we go look specifically at what it says about homosexuality or transgenderism, I just want to back up for a moment and speak more broadly about what Scripture says about sex and sexuality. And that's because the Bible isn't just a book of prohibitions, all right? It's not like the Bible only says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, which granted, yes, the Bible does have some of that in it. But the Bible says something more, and that is the Bible paints a positive picture about what sex and marriage is supposed to be like. And I would argue it's a beautiful picture at that. So that's why I want to back up for just a moment, lay a foundation for what it says more broadly about sex and marriage, and then we'll look and see what else it says in terms of prohibited behaviors. So first, I want to point out that Scripture teaches that God is the one who invented sex, right? Secular culture didn't give us sex. Hollywood didn't give us sex. God gave us sex, right? In fact, it was God's idea to make sex procreative, and it was God's idea to make sex pleasurable, right? Scripture also teaches that God made sex to occur only between a man and a woman and only within the context of a marriage relationship. And so far, all I've said here is the, the, the first two chapters of Genesis, right? Where God literally creates the universe, creates the world, creates humanity, and says, this is the blueprint for how you're supposed to function, sexually, relationally. 
So these are very famous passages from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 about how God creates man and female, male and female, says for them to be fruitful and to multiply, and says in the context of marriage, a man shall leave his mother and his father, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay? Again, most of this should be probably review for you. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people want to say to me, well, Alan, that's just the Old Testament. That's the old stuff. Like, you know, that's not a New Testament teaching per se. So how can you believe it's still relevant for us as Christians? And my response is, well, actually, no, it is a New Testament teaching. In fact, Jesus even cites this teaching in a response that he has to the Pharisees in Matthew 19. Listen to how Jesus responds. He says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now, I want you to, I want to just pause for a moment. Those words there that are in all capital letters, this is where Jesus is quoting the Genesis account of creation because he believes it's still relevant, right? So he says, God made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and his father and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So again, Jesus quotes the Genesis account of creation because it still believes it's valid and binding. And then notice, Jesus adds his own commentary to that Genesis passage. He says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Right? In other words, Jesus believes this man and woman coming together to create a one flesh union is a God-ordained institution. And this coupling of a man and a woman coming together to create a one flesh union, they are the only group, they're the only couple that's ever described in Scripture as being able to create a one flesh union, right? No other group of people, no other arrangement of individuals is ever described as being able to do that except for a man and a woman. And uh, so if you were to summarize then Jesus' view on sex and marriage, I'd put it this way. He believes it's about one man with one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime. And I emphasize that's Jesus' view because of this tendency for many non-Christians, as well as some people who might identify themselves as progressive Christians, often want to say, well, I'm only going to listen to what Jesus says. I only care about the red letters. Let's just look at the New Testament kind of teaching. Now, I reject that that's a legitimate way to evaluate what God says by just looking at the New Testament, but even if you were to do that, even if you were to concede that, I mean, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, right? So he's basically endorsing the Genesis account of creation and the nature of male-female prerequisite for sex and marriage. Now, if sex can only occur between a married man and a woman, then I want you to notice any other type of sexual activity outside of a married man and a woman is going to be considered sin. So no matter whether we're talking about sex before marriage, we would maybe call that uh, fornication, or homosexual sex, or adultery, or incest, or, or rape, or bestiality, notice any other behavior outside of a married man and a woman is going to be considered sin according to, to the Bible, and even according to Jesus. And I point this out is because we are not in any way singling out the sin of homosexuality or the sin of transgenderism in any kind of significant way. Like, we're not pointing it out and reserving it for some sort of special condemnation. In fact, quite the contrary. There's far more people who are engaged in sins number one and three that are engaged in sin number two, right? Because there's just a lot more people who are heterosexual and uh, then there are people who are identifying as, as gay and lesbian and engaging in homosexual sex. So again, there's no singling out that particular sin, right? I want you to also notice that just the Bible's teaching on sex and marriage alone disqualifies homosexual sex as an option. In other words, notice, I have not yet cited a single verse prohibiting homosexual behavior Yet already just the Bible's teaching, the positive case for sex and marriage that the Bible makes, that alone rules out homosexual sex as a possibility. Okay. So we technically wouldn't even need any of the other familiar passages, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, that rule out homosexuality. But we do know that there are some passages that the Bible does specifically address homosexual behavior. And 
I would put it is this. Both the Old and the New Testament teach that homosexual behavior is a sin. Now, there's about a dozen or so passages that address homosexuality in some form or another. I'm just listing here five of the ones that are the most common. Okay? Um, and what, what I want to emphasize here is what the Bible prohibits is homosexual behavior, the behavior, okay? regardless of why someone might engage in that behavior. And I want to comment about the nature of these these five particular passages. All of these five passages, and we'll look at a couple of them in just a moment, all these five passages categorically reject all forms of homosexual sex. Now, here's the reason why I'm making this point. There is a growing movement within some Christian circles of people who are trying to take the Bible and reinterpret the Bible in such a way where it makes the Bible sound like it's gay-affirming, they'll call it. And I, re I refer to this attempt as pro-gay theology. Now, this movement has been going on for decades, but the most recent expression of pro-gay theology is, is very new, and they have much better arguments than they had, say, you know, two or three decades ago. So let me explain to you what the most current expression of pro-gay theology is so that when it undoubtedly is presented in your church or in your community, you are able to be aware of it and mindful of it and know how to respond to it, okay? So this is the most common, and, uh, most common expression you're going to hear of pro-gay theology if you hear it today. Here's what they say. They say the Bible absolutely condemns homosexuality, but only abusive coercive or exploitive forms of homosexuality. Like homosexual gang rape that we see in Sodom and Gomorrah. Or master-slave sodomy where a master takes advantage of his slave. Or pederasty when men have sex with boys. But these are abusive, coercive, exploitive forms of homosexuality. And modern day gays and lesbians today do not engage in those abusive, coercive acts. They have loving, consensual relationships that are not at all exhibited by any of these kinds of abuses. So notice how they're arguing. They're saying the Bible condemns that kind of homosexuality the abusive, coercive kind, not this kind of homosexuality, the loving, consensual kind. And by doing that, they can therefore say, ah, see, so therefore, modern-day gays and lesbians are not in any danger of violating the Bible's prohibitions, okay? And uh, I have a picture there of Matthew Vines. He's one of the most uh, well-known uh, people who has created an organization that is systematically going around uh, the United States, and I actually have to check to see if he's coming into Canada or not, or has, but he goes around and is systematically training Christians to adopt this new view of sexuality. And he calls his organization the Reformation Project, interestingly, because think about it. He sees his efforts in line with the noble reform efforts of Martin Luther. And he believes his Reformation will be just as significant as that of Luther's. So this is, this is the new expression of pro-gay theology, and that's why, when I was on this previous page here, I reminded you that these passages, the reason I said this, these passages all categorically condemn all types of homosexual sex, not just abusive, coercive, or exploitive forms. And that's significant because if you can show even one passage does that, you will undermine pro-gay theology. So let's take a look at uh, one passage just as an example. So this is Leviticus 18.22. It's the center, center verse. Look how straightforward this passage is. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Again, notice how straightforward the wording is. If you're a man, you can't lie with another man as you would another woman. Do you notice, do you see, there's no indication that any particular type of homosexual sex is in view. All you have is a categorical rejection of all types of homosexual sex, whether abusive or coercive, or whether loving or consensual. Even consider the context. The verse before is a prohibition against sacrificing your children to Molech. Okay? So for those of you parents who have teenagers, you're out of luck. Okay? Sorry. I can say that I have two teens, right? The verse after is a prohibition against having sex with animals. 
So nothing even in the context suggests that this verse is limited only to abusive and coercive homosexual sex acts. All you have is a wholesale rejection of any type of homosexual sex. And so by understanding what the Bible teaches, you could then potentially refute the attempt by pro-gay theologians or pro-gay theology advocates to say, well, the Bible only condemns abusive kinds of homosexuality. Well, no, not, no, it doesn't. I mean, just one verse, it doesn't. I would argue all five of those verses that I showed you do exactly the same thing. Now, so, so that's understanding pro-gay theology and kind of how to respond to it. But I just want to just back up a little bit here and just say, okay, well, what about generally what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And although, as I said, there's probably 12 verses that address homosexuality, and those five are the most popular, my suggestion is if you're ever going to share your views about what you think the Bible says about homosexuality, my suggestion is to turn to Romans 1 as your initial text. Like, I think Romans 1 is the most straightforward and defensible text on the issue, all right? Uh, let's take a look at what it says. And by the way, just to give you some context here, Romans 1 is a creation narrative, okay? So in other words, the Paul is talking about how God's created the world, he's created humanity, he's designed things to function in a certain way. And Paul says in Romans 1 that the evidence of God's hand in creation is so obvious that men are without excuse to believe that there's a God who made what we see. Then Paul says, some people, however, reject the obvious evidence of God's hand in creation. And instead of worshiping God, the creator, they worship the creation. Paul says, these people who are in rebellion to God's truth, okay, Paul says, God gives them over to their degrading passions, meaning God sort of lets them continue in their rejection of him. And it comes to this particular passage. So, for this reason, God gave them over to their degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Now, I want to just comment one thing here. Uh, the word that's translated into English as function comes from the Greek word krisis, which according to the standard Greek dictionary means function or use, especially of sexual intercourse. So notice then what Paul says. Men abandon the natural sexual function of a woman. So Paul's making a design argument. He's saying men and women are designed to function in a heterosexual way, which, by the way, is perfectly consistent with the context of Romans 1. Remember, Romans 1 is a creation narrative. God's made the world this way. He's made humanity this way. God's made men and women to function heterosexually, but these people reject that design. And so these men abandoned the sexual function of a woman and instead had sex with other men. The women abandoned the natural sexual function that a man provides, and those women had sex with other women. So the passage is very um, descriptive, okay? And here's three reasons why I think it should be your sort of go-to text if you're ever bringing up this subject. Number one, it mentions both male and female homosexuality, okay? Other passages don't explicitly mention female homosexuality, even though I believe it implies that. Romans 1 says it specifically, so that's one advantage. Here's a second advantage. Romans 1 is a New Testament text. Now, can anyone here tell me what possible objection might someone raise if you cited, say, Leviticus 18.22 as the passage that prohibits homosexual sex? Can anyone tell me? Yeah, what would they say? They might say that it's like specifically for the Israelite people at the time. That's right. They might say that it's specifically, Leviticus is specifically for the Israelite people under the uh, theocracy, Right? And they might even point out that, hey, you know, Leviticus also has other kinds of prohibitions that you don't care about, right? Leviticus prohibits wearing clothes made out of two different kinds of linen or planting two different kinds of crop in the same field. Or it also prohibits eating pork products like, like bacon. <laughs> wow, that would be awful, right? Have you ever had bacon wrapped filet mignon? It's amazing, right? Because... Because filet is the, the most tender cut of steak. I love it because you can get a filet and you can cut that thing with a butter knife. It's so tender. Now, 
here's the dilemma that I always face because I was like, man, but a ribeye, it's more of a marbled, you know, kind of a steak. It's got that more marbling of the fat, so it adds more flavor. So I'm like, well, what, what do I go with, you know, when I want to order? So here's the solution. You get the, you get the filet mignon and you wrap it in bacon. And that way you get the tenderness of the filet with the flavor of a ribeye. It's just like, oh, thank the Lord, right? That that Leviticus passage is no longer relevant, right? Thank the Lord for that. So, so yeah, so they'll point out, well, look, there's all these verses in Leviticus that, that have these prohibitions that you ignore. Oh, but when it comes to homosexuality, you still stick to that. Aren't you being inconsistent? Now, to be fair, they have a point, right? It's true, we don't follow all the Levitical prohibitions, okay? Now, does that mean Leviticus is irrelevant? No, there's a whole interesting discussion about how the old law applies to the New Testament Christians. But notice, now you're on a tangent, Okay. <laughs> Romans 1 is not only a New Testament text, it's written during the new covenant of Christ, which is the covenant that governs Christian behavior primarily today. So by citing Romans 1 first, instead of, say, Leviticus, you avoid that whole debate. And then the third uh, benefit to Romans 1 is that it just clearly describes the behavior that's in question. Notice, all of the word homosexual does not appear anywhere in the text. It's perfectly clear what behavior Paul's talking about. It's the behavior where a man abandons the natural sexual function of a woman and has sex with another man. So that's, those are three benefits to that particular passage. So that's a quick overview of what the Bible says about homosexuality. Let me just mention two things it doesn't say about homosexuality. Number one, it doesn't say that homosexual sex or satisfying transgender ideation Uh, which we'll get to in a moment. It does not teach that this is the worst sin, the supreme abomination, the unpardonable crime against God. Every time we see this sin mentioned in Scripture, it's listed amongst other sins, and there's no indication that it's the greatest sin. Now, you might say, but Alan, come on. I mean, isn't it a serious sin? My response to you would be, yeah, (laughs) it's a serious sin. And it's a serious sin because it's a sexual sin, and the Bible makes a point to explain why that's significant, right? Paul, uh, the Bible says that, that sexual sins are committed against the body, whereas non-sexual sins are committed outside the body. This is 1 Corinthians 6.18, where Paul makes this distinction. Seems to be that there must be something going on with sexual behavior where you're not just bringing two bodies together in a sex act. It's like you're uniting souls. And that's why Paul says in that passage, you know, What does righteousness and unrighteousness have in common? How can you unite your body with a prostitute, right? So homosexual sex would be in this unique category of a sin committed against the body. But even then, there's no indication that it's the worst of all sexual sins. The other thing that I think is important for us to understand that Scripture does not teach is that you have to, it doesn't teach that you have to end your relationship with a friend or family member that identifies as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. In other words, if they come out and say to you, hey, I'm gay, or hey, I'm trans, or hey, I'm non-binary, it's not like you have to be like, okay, our relationship's over. In fact, I would suggest the Bible teaches the opposite, that we should lean into those relationships, that we should pursue these people, that we should love these people. In fact, I would say that our, our ability, our, our, our opportunity to have a positive difference in their life will be a function of our relationship. So I don't see how it's possible that we could end that relationship and expect to have any kind of an influence in their life. So those are some things about uh, homosexuality that the Bible says and doesn't say. I want to just make a couple of comments, though, about what it says about transgenderism, because there's a temptation by a lot of people to say, well, the Bible says nothing about this. And while, although some expressions of transgenderism are certainly different than we see in the first century, the Bible still lays out really clear principles that lay a foundation for understanding whether satisfying transgender ideation is legitimate or not. Let me mention two real quickly. The first is this. Scripture teaches that God made human beings in only two sexes. Not three, not one, not anything more, just two, male and female, of course, we get that from the very famous passage in Genesis 1.27. But more relevant for our purposes here is I believe Scripture presumes that our gender identity should match our biological sex. Now, 
Let me back up here and explain what I mean by that. Gender identity, of course, is a modern term that refers to a psychological belief that someone has about what gender they believe themselves to be, male or female or something else. So notice, it's not a part of our physical body. They would say it's a part of your psychological core sense of self. It's, you know, part of your personality. It's, you know. And so um, the Bible seems to presume that there are only two gender identities and, you know, male and female, and there's no indication anywhere in Scripture that our gender identity should differ anything from our biological sex. So if we're biologically male, we're supposed to identify as male. If we're biologically female, then we should only identify as female. Now, the opposite of this would be someone who identifies as transgender. Now, this would be a person, for example, who is biologically male, but instead of having a male gender identity, they'd say, perhaps, well, I have a female gender identity. Or if they're female body, they have a male gender identity. This would be someone who's transgender. Now, again, the Bible seems to presume that this is not something that can happen. And in fact, every time Scripture talks about someone crossing a gender boundary, it always refers to that event in a negative way. Let me give you two examples, one from the Old, one from the New Testament. Deuteronomy 22.5. A woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on woman's clothing, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. So here we have a verse where God uh, makes a commandment intended to maintain the distinction between the two sexes. Now, people who are transgender say to me, Alan, come on. That's ridiculous. This is a verse that bans cross-dressing. We transgender people, we're not merely cross-dressing. We have a bona fide transgender identity. And so therefore, it's, it's okay, is it what it's presumed. But here's the problem. The Bible doesn't care whether you have a transgender identity and you're doing this or whether you're just cross-dressing and you're doing this. All the Bible cares about here is behavior, right? Just like I said with homosexual sex. What the Bible prohibits is the behavior. And in the same way here, the Bible doesn't care whether you have a transgender identity or not. There's no exception being made for that. It's just simply a categorical rejection of taking on the role of the opposite sex by virtue of the way you dress. By the way, the context of this verse, the verse before is a command to take care of a neighbor's donkey. The verse after this verse is a prohibition against killing a mother bird. So nothing even in the context suggests that this verse is limited only to, you know, cross-dressing, you know? No, it's just a wholesale rejection of taking on the role of the opposite sex by virtue of how you dress. New Testament verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, have Paul just giving a list of people engaged in sinful behavior. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he has a list. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, so on and so forth. Now, just a quick heads up. Depending on the English translation you're using, I use NASB, sometimes your English translation will combine the words effeminate and homosexual into one English word. And it might just say homosexual. But just so you know, in the Greek, it's two words. Uh, the Greek word for homosexuals here is arsenokoitai. The Greek word here for effeminate is malakoi. Now, malakoi literally means soft men. And this is a reference to, to men in the first century that took on the appearance or role of a woman by the way they dressed, by their makeup, by their mannerisms, or even sometimes through castration. And so notice the Bible's saying, hey, if you're doing that, if you're crossing a gender boundary, if you're taking on the role of a woman in virtue of these ways, this is prohibited. It's sin. So notice, both Old and New Testaments, whenever it addresses someone crossing a gender boundary, it speaks negatively about that. Now, let me add an important clarification here, because I don't want you to misunderstand. So far, what I said about um, gender identity here, I'm not in any way trying to suggest that men and women must adopt all the gender-typical behaviors associated with you know, Western masculinity or Western femininity, okay? You do not, as a man or a woman, have to adopt the gender-typical behaviors or mannerisms associated with 
Western masculinity or Western femininity. And here's what I mean by that. If you're a guy, it's okay if you don't like football and firearms and video games and blowing things up, <laughs> okay? It's okay if you prefer to play the flute or you prefer ballet, or you prefer art, that's totally fine. You are no less a guy, you are no less masculine, you are no less a man. You're just a guy that likes the flute. In the same way, if you're a girl here today, if you're a female today, it's okay if you don't like shopping and, you know, sappy chick flicks and listening to Taylor Swift. Like, it's fine. If you prefer to work on cars, or you like ice hockey, or something that's typically associated with masculinity, it's okay. You're no less a girl, you're no less a female, you're no less feminine. You're just a girl who likes ice hockey or working on cars or whatever, okay? The point is not, are you following the gender-typical behaviors associated with Western masculinity and femininity? No. The question is, is what gender do you believe yourself to be? That's what the Bible is concerned about. Do you believe yourself to be a man or a woman? And I'm telling you, the biggest lie that we are hearing in our culture today, they'll say to a girl, oh, wait, you don't like pink? You don't like dresses? Oh, maybe you're trans. Maybe you're non-binary. Change your pronouns. Change your name. Socially transition. This is a lie. It is not, we are not taking our cues of masculinity and femininity from, from Western culture, from Canadian culture, from American culture. No, we take our cues from Scripture. But that's the lie that they're, they're telling everybody. Okay, so that's a quick overview of what the Bible says about sex, marriage, homosexuality, and transgenderism. Let me just end here with a couple of principles that can help us to navigate our relationships with friends and family who identify in this way. Now, you know, on your notes there, there's no way we're going to get through all of them. Let me just kind of go as fast as I can through some of them because I think they'll be practical for your situations. Um, first, principle, first set of principles are geared for a church context, okay? So, first one. We should, as Christians, welcome self-identified gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgenders people to church. Now, what do I mean by that? When I say welcome, I don't mean we should let them in the door. By welcome, I mean we should make them feel welcome. Like, be glad they're here. Thank them for coming. Show them the best seat in the house. Introduce them to the pastor. Invite them to the next concert, barbecue, whatever it is that you do. Don't we want them to experience genuine Christian fellowship and see what that looks like? Don't we want them to hear the preaching that's coming from the pulpit, presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ? How will they ever be every experience and hear that if they're not made to feel welcome when they first come. Now, having said that, church leadership is strictly off limits to anyone engaged in ongoing unrepentant sin. Now, notice, this is not just a rule just for gays, lesbians, and transgender people. No, this is a rule for anybody in the church. If you're engaged in ongoing, unrepentant sin, I don't care who you are, you can't be a pastor, an elder, a leader, a teacher, worship team, whatever, in the church, right? So this is why I say, look, yeah, we welcome these people in the church, but it doesn't mean we give them authority or leadership or power in the church. Treat faithful Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction or are confused about their gender identity. Let's treat them Uh, like we would any other believer. Now, listen carefully to what I'm talking about here. So by faithful Christian, I'm talking about a person who, um, who, who, I'm sorry, a faithful Christian who struggles with same-sex attraction. Let's just take that for example. I'm talking about a person who, let's say say they're male, and they are same-sex attracted. They're attracted to other men. But what they say is, I do not want to satisfy those attractions either through lustful fantasy or through sexual behavior with another man. I'm going to reject those desires. I'm going to mortify those temptations because I want to obey the commands of Christ and live in obedience to him. Now, that kind of person, and by the way, I know many people, a good friend of mine, Christopher Yuan, I'm not outing them, by the way, these are public individuals, Christopher Yuan, Beckett Cook, Sam Alibari, there's lots of people who are like that. 
Yeah, they have same-sex attraction and have for their entire adult life, but they are rejecting those attractions because they want to obey the commands of Christ. I'm saying those individuals should be treated like any other Christian. Why? Because they are just like any other Christian. Every single one of us in this room has some desires which, if we satisfied, would be considered sin. So what do we do with those desires? We reject them. We try to mortify them, right? We don't satisfy them. It's because we want to follow the commands of Christ. And so a person who struggles with same-sex attraction is in exactly the same situation. They have those temptations, desires, but they're rejecting them because they want to obey Christ. That kind of person, man, they could be a pastor, elder, it doesn't matter. Don't make jokes about homosexuality or transgender people. I know there shouldn't be even a reason that I should say this, but for some reason, I hear it all the time, and this is a big mistake, okay? Men and women, boys and girls who identify as LGBT are made in the image of God and intrinsically valuable, deserving of dignity and respect. There is no place for coarse joking or dehumanizing talk about these people because to do so is to mock an image bearer of God. That's not an option for us to do that. And I remember I, you know, I've hosted a small group in my home for 20, 22 years now. And over that time, we've had a number of men and women who've had same-sex attraction. They told my wife and I about those situations and, and, and how they struggled with that. But sometimes they didn't tell the rest of the group, and here's why. We had a few instances where a guy would make jokes about gay people, talk with a lisp, do other kinds of mocking behavior. And of course, this guy or girl who's struggling with same-sex attraction, they're thinking to themselves, I will never share my struggle in this group. I will never share it because here's this guy that's just making, making fun of me. Right? Listen, Brothers and sisters, we cannot do that. These people who are struggling with same-sex attraction or the gender identity, they need our love, they need our prayer, they need our support, they need our accountability. But when we mock their sin, we're basically telling them, shut up, I don't want to hear about it, because what you're struggling with makes me feel uncomfortable. Man, that is not an option for us. If we were struggling with any other sin, we'd want to be able to have the freedom to come out and say, man, I am struggling with this. Please hold me accountable. Pray for me. But we're basically shutting that down by virtue of the way that we mock people who um, experience same-sex attraction. Number five, cultivate a safe and loving environment at your church for people with their faith, sexuality, and or gender identity. Please do not misunderstand what I'm saying here. I am not suggesting to lower our standards or lower our biblical ethics. I hope you've heard me loud and clear today that the Bible teaches that satisfying same-sex attractions or transgender ideation is sinful behavior, period. However, what I am starting to suggest is, look, if someone comes out to you and says, man, I, I, I think I'm attracted to the same sex, or maybe I think I'm bisexual, or gosh, I'm confused about my gender identity, Let's not just blast them with the Bible verse and kick them out of the church. <laughs> Let's lead with love and express some grace. Man, if they share that with you, thank them for, for being vulnerable. Thank them for trusting you with that information. Invite them to tell their story and, and so you can better understand who they are and what they're going through. Maybe offer to hold them accountable or, or be a mentor depending on the nature of your relationship or where you're at or maybe you could point them to someone who is. But man, don't, what do we want that for ourselves, like if, I mean, I think of sins that I have struggled with for, for many years. Man, I'd, I'd hope that even though I struggle with these sins, it might be the case that one day I succumb to that temptation and I falter and I sin. Wouldn't I want somebody to come to me, a brother, and say, man, Alan, I, I know, you, I know you've, you've fallen here. How can I pray for you? How can I hold you accountable? How can I support you? All I'm saying, let's, let's provide that opportunity also for people who are struggling in this area as well. So those are some principles um, that would apply in a church context. I've been given permission by the leadership here at the conference to have five extra minutes to address some non-church-related situations. So, like, just general principles, okay? So, in case you're looking at your watch, like, wait a minute, he's supposed to end now. I get five more minutes, okay. A <laughs> couple of principles that will apply in any situation. Number one, we need to avoid cliches that kill. 
And cliches that kill are these short, pithy little statements that we Christians make that we think are cute and clever, but oftentimes do more harm than good. And there are a dozen of them, okay? Uh, Let me just mention two very quickly. First one, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, okay? Uh, This is so cringe. Uh, Okay, (laughs) I don't know why we keep saying this. I thought this was over. Like, this is a big thing, like, in the 80s and the 90s. And I thought it had ended. But there's been a resurgence of Christians posting this to think they're being cute and clever. And all they're doing is just simply offending and annoying everybody, okay? Listen, if you want to say to your friend or family member that God, that, that they're supposed to function in a heterosexual way, then just explain it through basic, like, biology, or, or just turn to the Bible and, and explain it. Don't resort to a corny cliche like this that just simply unnecessarily offends them. Here's another one. It's a little tougher. God loves the sin but hates the sinner. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said it backwards. God hates the sin but loves the sinner. Okay? Or some version of that. Now, I know this sounds biblically consistent. And you might even think it sounds compassionate. But let me tell you something. The vast majority of men and women who I've talked to who identify as LGBT say to me, Alan, I cannot process this statement. Because in my mind, being gay, it's not just what I I do, it's who I am. And do you know what's the only word they hear in that entire sentence? Take a guess. Hey, exactly. They hear, God hates me, and guess what? You hate them too. So it literally has the opposite effect that you intend. So here's my suggestion. If you wanted to believe that God loves them despite what they're currently doing, don't don't say this corny cliche that that kills, right? Instead, do something. Don't say something, do something. And that thing that you should do is this. Love them. You say God loves them? Why don't you show it by how you treat them? After all, you're an ambassador of for Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20. You represent God. And so to the degree to which you show love and and, um, care for this person will be the degree to which they say, well, gosh, he's a Christian or she's a Christian. Man, maybe God does love me. So we are the hands and feet of God. And so that's how we can best express that through the way we treat them. All right, uh, let's get number two. Make your relationship with, the, with them a high priority. I think I already alluded to that. Again, I think your ability to have an influence in their life will be a function of that. In fact, every time I have had a person who has lived a life satisfying same-sex attraction, abandon that life, here's how it worked. They first put their faith in Christ. They became a believer, and then eventually they abandoned uh, their um, satisfying those attractions, but it was always because I had first built a relationship with them. I spent years being their friend, caring for them in whatever capacity it was, and that they were willing to listen to me and say, to me, and say hey, Alan, what, do you, what do you think I should do here? And I was able to speak into their life. Um, don't confuse love with accepting behavior. This is just a problem with our modern culture having bought into a new definition of love. Love is interpreted as If I love someone, I must accept everything they do. And so if a son or a daughter comes out and says, Dad, Mom, I'm gay or I'm trans, the temptation by the parent is to say, well, I love my son or my daughter, therefore I should accept everything that they're saying about themselves. But we all know that's not the case, right? For those of you who are parents or have ever been parents or ever had parents, which this would be everybody, you know, like, I, okay, I have two teens. I already mentioned that. If my son starts to mistreat my daughter, you know what I'm going to say to my son? Hey, stop it. What you're doing is wrong. Do I love my son? Sure. Do I think what they're doing is wrong? Absolutely. Is there any conflict with that idea that you can love someone and disagree with them? Not at all. But we're, as a church, buying into that false understanding of love. Let's get that. Oh, practice principles of consistency. This is so critical. Um, This principle will answer 99% of the questions that you have right now that go something like this. Alan, my daughter or my sister or my friend said they're gay, whatever, something. What should I do? They told me to X, Y, and Z, all right? What should I do? How should I respond? And here's the principle that that I have developed over the years of living with friends and family who identify this way. Here's the principle. Treat a homosexual the same way you treat a heterosexual in a morally comparable situation. 
In other words, if you want to know what you should respond to your LGBT friend with, just ask the question, what if they weren't LGBT and that we were in the same morally comparable situation, how would I respond? Whatever that answer is will be the answer to how you should respond with your LGBT friend. I had a friend of mine, she's a flight attendant. She said, Alan, all these coworkers that I have that are flight attendants, they're gay guys. Lots of gay guys in the flight attendant industry. I said, okay. She said, one day, uh, this gay guy showed me a picture. We were just kind of chatting. She showed me a picture of himself with his gay lover. And she said, I freaked out. I didn't know what to say. I said, let me ask you a question. What if a female flight attendant showed you a picture of herself with her boyfriend, so heterosexual boyfriend, girlfriend, and you knew they lived together, slept together, having sex together, okay? I said, how would you respond if you got shown that picture? She's like, oh, that's easy. I would just ask her, oh, what's his name? Where did you guys meet? I'm like, okay, do the same thing with a gay guy. What's the difference? Both are in, are in sexually inappropriate relationships, right? So they're morally comparable. So if you ask a girl who's sleeping with her boyfriend, if you ask her, what's his name? Are you condoning fornication by asking the question, what's his name? You're not, right? You're just asking. If you say to her, hey, this boyfriend of yours, uh, how, where did you meet? She's like, college. Have you just condoned fornication? Have you? What do you think? No. Okay, so if you ask a gay guy who shows a picture of him and his boyfriend, you say, oh, what's his name? Have you just condoned, have you just approved of homosexual sex? No. You're just being a human being, right? You're not condoning anything by saying, oh, what's his name? Where did you meet, right? So this is why I say, treat them as you would anybody else in a morally comparable situation. And this will apply to a whole bunch of things. Two last principles, and we'll end here. Um, don't make homosexuality or transgenderism the issue. I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, Alan, they're like, how do I bring up homosexuality and tell this person that being gay is a sin? I'm like, that, that's not the only thing you can talk about, you know? Like, you can just be their friend and hang out with them. I had a guy say to me, Alan, he goes, uh, I work at Starbucks. He said, the barista there is a gay guy. I said, okay. He goes, how do I, so when I'm at work, how do I bring up the issue that being a gay is a sin? I'm like, is that what you do to all your coworkers? Like, figure out what their sin is and then try to mention it at work? <laughs> like, hey, uh, this customer wants a caramel macchiato. Could you get that brewed up? And stop looking at porn. <laughs> like, who does that, right? Just, just go to work, hang out with them, work with them, and yeah, if the subject comes up, about homosexuality, fine, talk about it. I'm not saying avoid it, but don't act as if it's the only thing to talk about, and you've got to somehow figure out how to steer your conversation to bring up that issue. Finally, I'll say this. Look, if you're so eager to share your convictions with someone who identifies as LGBT, you're like, man, i, I got to tell them something. Because it's just, it's just so passionate about it. Here's my suggestion. Make Jesus the issue. Tell them about the gospel. Because after all, isn't that what ultimately matters? Right? Suppose you were to convince a person who's a gay man to stop having homosexual sex. Would that save them? No. Their eternal destiny would still be in jeopardy. Because merely abandoning a behavior does not save you. They'd still be guilty of crimes they've committed against God and in need of a pardon, just like every other person on earth. That's why I often say to people and try to remind them, look, our, our hope for homosexuals is not heterosexuality. It's holiness. We're not trying to make gay people straight. We're trying to lead them straight to Jesus, right? Because if they trust in Christ, then the Holy Spirit comes into their life and transforms them from the inside out. And for our trans friends, yeah, our hope isn't a change in their gender identity, but rather in their spiritual identity. And I'm telling you, only the great physician can do that. All right, I will stop there because I know I'm over time, but thank you. And uh, we're going to have Daniel come up and transition us thank you. into a Q&A time. Yeah, thank you so much, Alan. Um, aren't you thankful for people like this that spend their lives kind of informing us about good topics? Can we just thank him one more time? Um, really appreciate that.
uh, and just really appreciate uh, how you communicate with such grace and compassion on these topics, and uh, you do that so well. So thanks for that. We're going to trans- uh, transition really quickly into Q&A. We're going to take two minutes to kind of reset up the stage. We're going to bring up our panel, so we're going to play a bit of music for two minutes. Maybe don't go anywhere, because we're going to start really soon. <laughs> 